All right, so I got this pencil and I got this uh, intelligence test that was used by the US military after World War I. I'm gonna try to fill this thing out. Hopefully I get a good score. So let's see, let me, let me see what I gotta do. All right, let's do this. Oh, co Coco, um, I don't know if I'm gonna get a great score. I mean, Coco's distracting me. So I'm not sure if I'm supposed to choose this weird, this weird, let's see if I can, yeah, there's a weird triangle here. Is that the right answer? I'm, I'm not really supposed to, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. Well, Coco is sitting on the intelligence test. So I, I don't think I'm gonna pass. She just, she doesn't like this test. She just wants pets. All right, so this test would have been presented as a scientifically valid way to measure people's abilities and aptitudes. And the results of the test would have been uh, used to assign people to different roles in the military. We'll talk uh, more about this test later in the lecture. Um, but yeah, your performance on this thing could be one reason why you might be assigned to become an officer or assigned to go to the front and have a much higher percentage chance of dying in the war. So this is uh, just a little object lesson on one way in which intelligence testing and mental testing was used in society. And uh, yeah, let's jump into the major topic of this lecture. All right, say goodbye, Coco. See you in a bit. All right, let's get started. This is part of the learning module on psychology, eugenics, and intelligence testing. This is the intelligence testing portion. We'll do a short history of the development of, in, of mental testing. And that's about it. This is a topic that we could go into great detail on. Intelligence tests are widespread. We still use them in lots of ways uh, today. But uh, this is gonna focus on the early development of these tests and some of the connections to the eugenics movement and how these tests were used in society. Okay, if you're following along, do read chapter four from the textbook on intelligence testing. Here's the roadmap for today. I'm gonna to describe what I'll call the intelligence test race, uh, where we have multiple psychologists trying to create an intelligence test that works. An e example of one uh, first test that was widely adopted is the Binet-Simon test. We'll talk about what that test looks like. And then we'll go through some examples about how these tests were used in the U.S. for purposes of eugenics campaigns. At the very end, we'll talk about a few critical responses to the use of intelligence tests in society. Intelligence is an interesting word. And for me, I kind of have these two feelings about it. On the one hand, it might be something, well, everybody knows what that means. It means something like I'm smart or I'm really creative or something like that. On the other hand, the more I've learned about intelligence testing, uh, the more I wonder what this word refers to and, and what it means in terms of uh, psychology. So in, we'll, we'll see in today's lecture, which sort of ground what psychologists have meant about intelligence, primarily in terms of how this construct has been measured. So some questions to consider throughout are, one, what is intelligence? Two, what are intelligence tests and what do they measure? And three, how have these tests been used in society? I think when approaching these questions, reasonable people have diverging opinions about how to uh, answer these things. And uh, what we're gonna do today is explore the historical context and development of IQ tests. And we're not going to have too much time to go into uh, modern usages of these things. So let's begin with the intelligence test race. To tie in from our last lecture on the eugenics movement, remember, a part of that movement was testing people, measuring different properties of people so that the eugenics movement could identify people with superior traits and abilities. So this movement, divide, uh, they desired scientific tests that could convincingly measure people's mental abilities. 
A general goal was to create these mental tests, then test whole segments of society so that you could measure everybody. And after you knew who were the smart people and who weren't, you could deploy positive and negative uh, eugenics social policies on people. So essentially, advantage people or disadvantage people based on their test results. This is the kind of overarching eugenics plan. The issue was they needed these tests, and this is where psychology comes in. So many psychologists were committed to the eugenics movement and were in a kind of race to develop suitable mental tests to supply the tests. It's around the 1900s, if you look at research being published around this time, you'll see psychologists around the world publishing lots of papers on mental tests. And they're describing the different tests that they'll give to people and how to do the tests and how to measure the thing and how to get a number or whatever to, to say whether a person is um, smart or in the middle or not very smart. At, in addition, uh, national governments are beginning to use and or considering to use the results of these tests in conjunction with social policy and decision making. So we'll see examples of that near the end of the lecture. Here's one person involved, James McKean Cattell. He's a psychologist. He's the founding editor of Psychological Review. That's one of the premier journals of the American Psychological Association. He was an APA president. In 1895, he bought the journal Science and edited it for many years. And uh, he was a psychologist with many different research interests, but he was also a eugenicist and in many ways was uh, viewed Francis Galt and the founder, the father of eugenics as a research mentor. So Cattell had visited Galton's lab in the UK, and when he came back, he popularized a lot of Galton's psychological and eugenics ideas in the United States. Cattell ended up conducting research in the style of Galton, motiva motivated by eugenics. And one of those, I'll give you two examples. One of them was uh, de attempting to develop mental tests to measure individual differences in human quality. Here's a book by Galton called English Men of Science, Their Nature and Nurture. This is the UK guy. And this is where Galton tries to demonstrate that men of science in England had inherited superior traits. That's what, that's what made them be able to be uh, English men of science. And Cattell was interested in doing the same kind of research over here in the US. So he publishes a statistical study of American men of science. So it's just an example of the alignment of research interests. Here's a paper that I briefly put up in the last lecture from Cattell. It's Mental Tests and Measurement from 1890. We're thinking about the timeline here. 1865, we have Francis Galton proposing eugenics. In 1880, Francis Galton is doing the mental imagery research, having people imagine the breakfast table. Now in 1890, and on the other side of the Atlantic, we have Cattell, and he's publishing his ideas uh, kind of to expand upon the breakfast table task. Let's have people do some other stuff. So we've got 10 things here. These would be part of a physical and mental testing regime. Have people do things like um, name colors and see how fast they can do it, or bisect a line in the middle, see how well people can do that. So measure all those things on people. Now, here's an example uh, from, this is from 1896. By this time, Cattell was uh, at Columbia University here in New York City. And this is a form that would have been filled out for a student going to the lab to do, uh, to participate in the research. And you could see the kinds of measurements that were being taken. So there's some physical measurements, things like color of eyes, color of hair, breathing capacity, and then you go down to the bottom, you start seeing some of the mental tests. So there was some kind of memory test that was given or some kind of imagery test, and your performance would be marked down. So you can see that there'd be a lot of data points for an individual person. 
And one of the big questions was, could your performance on this barrage of individual mini tests predict something about an outcome in the real world? For example, could it predict how well these students would perform in their classes at Columbia University? But here's a problem. It didn't work. Cattell's tests weren't predictive. So, you know, uh, at the time, many psychologists were trying to approve upon these methods to develop a series of tests that actually would predict something. And this is where I'll bring in Alfred Binet. So Alfred Binet, he was a French psychologist, and he critiqued Cattell's tests for lacking um, base validity. They, on the surface, they weren't really measuring things to do with cognitive abilities. That's one of Binet's main arguments. So, I mean, if you look back here and you sort of say, okay, pressure causing pain. Imagine there's going to be something put on your arm. It's going to cause pressure. And then you have to be like, oh, that it's starting to hurt now. Take that amount of pressure and write it down on the form for that person. Now that, that doesn't really involve any type of cognitive ability. And maybe how much pressure on your arm you, you can take before it hurts, wouldn't it be a very good uh, predictor of how well you're going to perform in a college classroom? So Binet was thinking about improving upon the kinds of questions he would ask people. And ultimately, he developed a test that was became widely used. Here's Alfred Binet. He was working during the time when eugenics movements were spreading across the world and becoming very popular. He himself didn't talk so much about the eugenics movement, and he advocated for developing mental tests of children for um, other reasons. For example, at this time, the French government was already enacting social policies to institutionalize, quote, unfit children. So children were being sent away to different institutions on the basis of things like subjective judgments from teachers and parents. And Binet thought it would be better to have objective mental tests. This would allow a more rational decision policy. So instead of you know, parents who didn't want to raise children or a teacher who didn't like a kid having uh, a role to get their kids sent away to different institutions, um, a, a, a better scientifically valid test of aptitudes could be used if, if, if such a test could be developed. Now, Binet's work was uh, translated to English in 1916, although he published most of it be well before then. If you want to read the original stuff, you can get a copy of it from that link. Sorry, and that would be the translation. Here's an example of what he did. So Binet created a variety of puzzle tasks. I'll call them puzzle-like tasks. And he chose tasks that he thought required mental processing. So instead of things like, how much pressure can I put on your arm? He came up with tasks like this. And here's just a whole bunch of them. So for example, these are some easy tasks. You could ask a child, show me your eyes, nose, and mouth. Or this one, give your last name. So those are fairly easy. If we go down, compare two boxes of different weights or repeat a sentence of 10 syllables. If we go down even more, they get, they get a little more complicated. Like here's one, compare two figures from an aesthetic point of view. Or over here, uh, give the date complete. So the day, the month, the day of the month, and the year. If you notice, there's these labels, three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight years. Binet had this idea to create a big list of individual tasks 
And that's what we're seeing right here. And then he gave these tasks to children of different ages. So children of different ages would be tested on all of these tasks. And he started figuring out like which tasks different ages are good or bad at doing. So in his opinion, most three-year-olds can do these ones and most four-year-olds can do these ones and so on. So he systematically measured how children of different ages performed these different tasks. Here's a look at some of his basic results. We've got this table here. On the left-hand side, we see the different puzzle tasks. And up here, we see children of different ages. A convenient place to look to try to get a sense of what we're looking at is the numbers right here. So we're seeing performance from seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and 10-year-olds. All right. If you notice also, there's a plus and a minus for each of the years. So if we're looking at this number three and this number five, let me just zoom in a little bit. What we're seeing is, so for example, place five weights in order. That was a task. You'd have to, you have these five weights and you'd have to say which lightest to heaviest, you'd have to arrange them. And whoops, it looks like five children that were seven did that successfully, but 11 didn't. So five got positive, 11 didn't. When we go to the eight-year-olds, 11 got it, 29 didn't. Look what happens when we get to the nine-year-olds. 27 got it, 24 didn't. And the 10-year-olds, 22 got it, 20 didn't. Notice there's a transition. The younger children are having difficulty, most of them aren't being able to do this task, and the older children, more of them are being able to do this task. So he's gathering data, he's counting how many children can perform each task well, and how many children aren't doing that well on these tasks. And he's gathering a, an empirical database. So he's got this quantification problem here. You can imagine that he had a large number of results from many children who performed many of these tests. He recognized that intelligence was a complex, multidimensional, and fuzzy concept, but nevertheless, he wanted to take the results from one of these tests. So let's say you're a, you're a kid being tested. You would perform all these different tests, and you would have successfully or unsuccessfully performed all of them. So what do you do with that? All of those little measures of performance. Does that mean you're intelligent? Does that mean you should be institutionalized? What Binet attempted to do was come up with a set of rules to turn, to analyze all that data and to turn it into a simple single number. So he sought a method to create a convenient and simple scale that people could use. For example, the French government could use. His solution was mental age. All right, here's something about age. It's, it's pretty easy. So it's a kind of an, it's a, it's a catchy idea that he had. Age is like a ruler. It goes up in increments of one year at a time. Children develop physically and mentally as they grow. And roughly, you know, that tracks getting older by the years. Binet also partly assumed that children's mental abilities steadily increased every year until they became adults. He notes that a child's performance on just one of those little tasks signifies nothing, but that the pattern across five or six tests signifies something. So he says, 
it matters very little what the tests are, so long as they are numerous. One of the points here is that your performance uh, on one of these little tests for Binet isn't very important. What's important for Binet is something called norm-based comparison. His measurements create or uh, had meaning through comparison to a set of empirical norms. So let's talk about what that means. Empirical norms are existing measurements of how other children performed on the test. So remember, he's gone into schools in Paris and he's had lots and lots of children do all these little mini tests. And so he can say, okay, for, for all the six-year-olds that I tested, you know, got 100 or 200 or 300 of them, here's how they did on these tests. Once you have this large empirical database, this allows Binet to assess how any new person performs the mini tests in comparison to the children he already measured. Right? So that's where the norm-based comparison comes in. He had to figure out a way to convert performance on a whole bunch of mini tests into a single number. He considered lots of different rules or algorithms for computing this single number. Here's an example, and he uses a mental age for that. So he says, a subject has the intellectual development of the highest age at which he passes all the tests with the allowance of one failure in the tests for that age. And he goes on to say, thus young Ernest has passed all the tests at nine years, except one. He has also passed all the tests at 10 years, except one. Therefore, we attribute to him the mental level of 10 years. So this part is actually kind of interesting with respect to the concept of mental age. It seems almost sensible. It's like, oh, this person has the mental age of a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old. But when you come down to it in Binet's system, these definitions are all to do with the mini tests that he made and the rules that he made for assigning a mental age on the basis of performance on those tests. And the thing about the rules are they kept changing. So if you read his research, he keeps trying he, he, he keeps realizing there's all sorts of potential issues and problems with the rules that he made, and he tries to improve upon them. And so, for example, uh, here we have a situation uh, where he, he, he says, okay, if Jean, who is nine years old, passes all the tests at the nine years except for two, and all the tests at 10 years except for two, based on his rule, that would make him eight years old. And so he starts thinking, oh, what do I do for a scenario like that? And he comes up with exceptions for that rule. And if you, yeah, if you read his research, he, he keeps trying to um, change how the, how the performance is distilled down into a mental age to come up with, uh, you know, his final system. And in this other quote, we can see some of the examples of him trying to improve on things. So he also changes thing, uh, questions that were in the mini tests. And um, he does all of these things pragmatically. I mean, the main point for Binet, one of the main points was to show that performance on the mini tests actually predicts something about real world performance. So here's a table showing that uh, he was able to successfully correlate his measurement of mental age with school performance. So for example here, an intelligence above the average, that refers to children who are, for example, nine years old, but they're performing the mini tests accurately or well for a 10 year old or 11 year old. So they're above the average. And if we see how they're doing in school, we could see that only one of those kids was behind. 16 of them were in, in regular school instruction. 
and seven of them were in advanced school instruction. Based on the tests, if you were, oops, sorry, if you were below the average, so if you're, let's say, a nine-year-old, but you're not doing well on the mental tests for eight-year-olds or seven-year-olds, it seems like most of those kids were behind in school instruction. So this was a success of Binet's tests. You know, compared to Cattell's work, he was able to show that the mental age measure was predicting something like school performance. His scale was in mental years. If you've taken a, a more modern IQ test, the scale of, of a modern IQ test is slightly different. Now, Binet died in 1911, and his strategy for mental testing was quickly adopted by American psychologists for the purposes of the eugenics movement. All right, for the next portion, we're going to see how um, these tests were used in society for purposes of eugenics. All right, first off, this is uh, the Human Betterment Foundation. They were an American eugenics organization on the West Coast. And this is a pamphlet. It's listing some of the members of the society. One of them is Lewis Terman, professor of psychology at Stanford University in California. Here's Lewis Terman. He was the APA president in 1923. He was a eugenics leader and advocate. And he's one of the people responsible for popularizing the Binet-Simon test that we were just learning about. And he popularized that in the USA as the Stanford Binet test. So he, uh, he took it uh, made it an English version because all it would be previously in a French version and uh, developed this thing for an American audience. He writes about it in the book The Measurement of Intelligence, an explanation of and a complete guide for the use of the Stanford Revision and extension of the Binet-Simon Intelligence Scale. Differently from Binet, Terman advocated for widespread intelligence testing across America for purposes of eugenics. We can see that in his writings here. For example, he says, it is safe to predict that in the near future, intelligence tests will bring tens of thousands of these high-grade defectives under the surveillance and protection of society. This will ultimately result in curtailing the reproduction of feeble-mindedness and in the elimination of an enormous amount of crime, pauperism, and industrial inefficiency. So the idea here is let's give these tests to as many people in the U.S. as we can and find all the defective people and remove them from society. That's what he's talking about. He also acknowledges that if you were to do such a thing and test everybody in America for their abilities, that uh, the testing would also identify children with very superior abilities and that the future welfare of the country sorry, hinges in no small degree upon the right education of these superior children. So his idea was go out and find the best, smartest, according to these tests, children, and give them the best school. In and around this time, consider what's going on historically. So World War I had broken out in 1914, and war was a big topic of concern for the eugenics movement. Eugenicists were debating whether war would help or hurt the cause of eugenics. So, for example, war could easily eliminate people because people die in wars. The question was, would it selectively eliminate unfit people, people that eugenicists thought were undesirable? Or was it randomly killing people 
even fit people. Eugenicists were interested in using mental tests in the war effort to ensure that the killing that occurred in the wars was biased towards people they didn't like. So for example, uh, American psychologists in World War I were involved in developing a system to test the American military uh, using the, these mental tests. The APA created several committees to determine how psychologists could help the war effort. If you look at the membership of these committees, you'll see that um, many of the psychologists were one-time APA presidents and also people who were publicly involved in the eugenics movement. So people like Robert Yerkes, Madison Bentley, Edward Thorndike, John B. Watson, Walter Scott, Robert Woodworth, and Carl Seashore. Here we have Robert Yerkes. He developed the Alpha Beta Test, and the Alpha Beta Test was uh, one of the largest cases of mass intelligence testing of Americans, so testing of about 1.75 million Americans. It was basically a mental census for the army. This was the Alpha Beta test. This is the Alpha version. This is the thing that I had printed out earlier and was trying to complete. They developed an Alpha test for literate soldiers and a Beta test for illiterate soldiers. And then they administered this test to 1.75 million uh, American army men. There was lots of problems with this. There was racial bias. For example, Yerkes argued that the results showed that whites had superior intelligence compared to blacks and immigrants. All of the results from the testing of the American military were published in eugenics journals. For example, here is the paper by Robert Yerkes published in the Eugenics Review and it's called The Eugenic Bearing of Measurements of Intelligence in the United States Army. So he clearly thought that testing all of these American army men had merits for the purposes of the eugenics movement. In that article, we can see how the uh, tests were intended to be interpreted and used. So for example, the purpose of the psychological tests in no previous war has military efficiency depended so much upon the prompt and complete utilization of the intelligence of the individual soldier. So the purpose of the psychological testing is to deliver a quick and fairly accurate classification of the men according to their general intelligence. And here are some of the things that can be accomplished. There's five of them. A, in the discovery of men whose superior ability recommends their advancement. B, in the prompt segregation in the development battalions of intellectually inferior men whose inaptitude would retard the training of the unit. C, in building organizations of equal or appropriate strength. D, in selecting suitable men for various army occupations or for special training in the technical schools. And E, in eliminating the feeble-minded. These are some of the grades you can get for your, quote, intelligence. And if you got an A, you would have very superior intelligence. You would be recommended for a high officer type. And you could go down to, for example, uh, D minus or E. These are uh, people that would be considered for regular, uh, a D minus, a very inferior intelligence would be considerates um, considered fit for regular service. Uh, if you're an E, maybe you'd be recommended for the development battalion or special service organizations, rejection or discharge. When I look at this, this is kind of code for if you score high on this, you're probably not going to be sent to the front. And if you score low, you probably will.
and that means you'd have a higher chance of getting killed. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these tests were racially biased. And so another place we can look at the analysis of the results is in a book published on them called A Study of American Intelligence by Carl Brigham. Based on the results, he made this ruler, um, which basically further validates racist conceptions of intelligence. And so if you're at the top of the ruler, it uh, means you're very intelligent. This is where the US officers ranked. And you can see how they're ranking people from different countries. So if you're from England, Scotland, Holland, Germany, US, Denmark, Canada, Sweden, Norway, Belgium, um, you're getting higher rankings in terms of your general intelligence. And if you go down the list uh, to it, different immigrant populations or um, African Americans, they're scoring lower. And so it's used to justify this idea that, for example, white Americans are the smartest people, immigrants aren't very smart, and white people are smarter than black people. Let alone the fact that these tests were biased in all sorts of other ways, and these measurements don't reflect the aptitudes of those people. So for example, um, this is another way to say that if you were an immigrant or a, a person of color, you probably weren't going to become an officer and you're going to have a higher likelihood of being sent to the front in the war. Now, with respect to intelligence testing, uh, since World War II and up till today, there's been lots of continued racism and claims about different groups of people having more general intelligence than others. This is a whole topic that we don't have time to go into. IQ testing has impacted several other places in society. For example, mental health. So eugenics proponents advocated that IQ tests be used to identify feeble-minded people. And once those people were identified, they should be institutionalized by the state and or involuntarily sterilized. We see this in Henry Goddard's work and this is published in 1927. Goddard was a psychologist. He actually uh, was responsible for getting Binet's intelligence test translated into English. And in this uh, article, who is a moron question mark, he describes how feeble mindedness, which was a common term used to describe uh, general category of people should be split into different classifications based on IQ, based on the, the mental age of, 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 uh, that was determined for you based on those tests. He proposed three categories. Uh, if you were an, a, an adult and you had the mental age of two, you, you should be called an idiot. If you had a mental age of three to seven, an imbecile, and a mental age of 8 to 12, uh, he used the word moron to describe that. And uh, he used these terms as well as invoked eugenic fears in his writings. So he would say things like, um, you know, there might be a lot of people out there who really are, quote, morons, and they should be prevented from, they, you know, they might look like anyone else, but if you did an IQ test, you could really tell, and then you should prevent them from having children. In his article, he considers two general solutions to how society should deal with people identified as morons by IQ tests. Here's one. So he says, perhaps 
our ideal should be to eventually eliminate all the lower grades of intelligence and have no one who is not above the 12 year intelligence level. But he notes that aside from the impossibility of eliminating half of the population, one may very well question whether such a thing would be desirable. Um, over here, he goes on to consider the idea that people who score low on these tests could be trained, could be educated, and that ultimately they could be very happy in doing uh, the kind of work that you or I might not want to do. So he thinks that society needs to keep these people and make them do menial labor that no one else wants to do. So these are, you know, uh, interesting societal perspectives and opinions. We're already going over time, so we're going to talk about some critical responses to intelligence testing in society. I highly recommend this book from Leo Kamen in 1974, if you can get a copy of it. It's called The Science and Politics of IQ. And basically, this is in 1974, a rebuttal to racist behavioral science. Kamen's conclusion is, there exists no data which should lead a prudent man to accept the hypothesis that IQ test scores are in any degree heritable. The IQ test America and the way in which we think about it has been fostered by men committed to a particular social view. That view includes the belief that those on the bottom are genetically inferior victims of their own immutable defects. The consequences have been that the IQ test has served as an instrument against the poor dressed in the trappings of science rather than politics. It's an excellent book. It's also interesting to look at this uh, this is a review of the book from 1976. This was published in the Journal of Black Psychology, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I wanted to say this here. So this person says, the book is a bombshell. Ironically, this bombshell seems to have exploded in the desert since there are no headlines and there is little noise within the profession of psychology. This seems to be a familiar pattern, unfortunately. And the familiar pattern is that uh, distressing societal uses of things like intelligence testing have been criticized but by very few individuals. And the larger systems like the uh, APA and uh, other uh, I guess, corporations that do the testing and psychologists that advocate on behalf of the testing, uh, they don't respond to the criticisms. Now, one group of people that have been taking up the task of be, being critical and advocating for change are the black psychologists. Uh, this is an organization formed in 1986 a very interesting history in this organization. So up through the 1960s, the American Psychological Association was overwhelmingly white. And in an APA meeting in 1968, a small group of black psychologists, they formed their own organization. Here's a link to it. The American, or what's it called here? Let's just see. Sometimes I get the, the Association of Black Psychologists. That's what it is. Here's their website. Go check it out. If you want to read more about the history, we have this article you can read. I'm going to actually assign that as one of the potential writing assignments here. It's a really interesting uh, history to the formation of this thing. And one of the issues that this group of psychologists was advocating for was around a moratorium for IQ testing of black children. So let's read this. 
So the Association of Black Psychologists fully supports those parents who have chosen to defend their rights by refusing to allow their children and themselves to be subjected to achievement, intelligence, aptitude, and performance tests, which have been and are being used to label black children as uneducable, place black children in special classes, potentiate inferior education, assign black children to lower educational tracks than whites, deny black children higher educational opportunities, and destroy positive intellectual growth and development of black children. So these are some uh, concerns that were raised by this group to the APA. You could read about that history. Uh, and at the time, this, is, this would be late 60s, you know, the APA did not respond to these issues. However, uh, one positive as aspect of the advocacy was that in 1979, this group successfully uh, led a moratorium on intelligence testing of black children in California, which is still in effect. And here's a link to an article that you could read if you're interested more about that history. In terms of critical responses to intelligence testing in psychology, some of the best work I've read about that is in the Journal of Black Psychology. And this was a journal that that group of psychologists formed. It's been publishing articles since the 1970s, and they have many articles that are excellent on the topic of intelligence testing and its impacts on society. So I'd encourage you to go check that out if you're interested. All right, my lights are starting to go out and I think we are on the last slide. So this is the last portion of the learning module on psychology, eugenics, and intelligence testing. Your next step would be to complete the quiz or any assignments that you want to do. Do that before the due date. And the next learning module will be on the topic of associations and association learning. So I'll see you over there.